Welcome everyone to tonight's public forum, Spin and Secrecy, Refugees in the Media. This forum is being hosted by the Canberra Refugee Action Committee. My name's Sophie Singh. I'm a member of the Refugee Action Committee and I'll be chairing the forum tonight. We do have a, a, a full house, so um, I don't think we have any vacant seats, but if there are any vacant seats, can you put your hand up so someone who's standing up at the back. I think there's a couple of vacant seats, or at least one over here. Um, and there's a sitting space here. So two people. <laughs> and there's a bit of um, floor space here. So um, don't be timid. Um, it might be preferable to stand in. So there's, I think, the one vacant seat there. There's a bit of floor space here. Um, uh, such is the, the um, uh, interest in the topic and also, obviously, the interest in our speakers. Can I ask if you haven't already turned off your mobile phone that you, that you do that, please? Before I introduce our speakers, I would like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people, who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we are meeting tonight, and pay my respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal nation, both past and present. I extend the respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in attendance tonight. And it occurred to me as we prepared for this event that Australia's first people were the first to be subjected to the spin and secrecy tactics of successive colonial, state, territory and federal governments over the last 228 years. And the proud struggle around ongoing dispossession, double speak and dog whistling continues today. I'd just like to foreshadow that after uh, our speakers have, have spoken and there, there will be an opportunity for questions from the floor, I will be asking the meeting to consider two motions um, and asking you to vote on those. One's in relation to the threatened deportation of 267 asylum seekers back to immigration detention in Nauru and Manus Island. And the second is in regards to the death of Reza Bharati and the ongoing threats to Benham Sata, who was a witness to Reza's murder. The text for these motions will, dis will be displayed on the screen later in the meeting. So rarely has there been an issue where language has been so central and intentional in its use by successive Australian governments, both coalition and ALP, to shape a very deliberate narrative, a narrative intended to create specific public perceptions about people who dare to board a boat bound for Australia to seek our protection. And while the narrative hasn't been a static one and the permutations can be charted against the shifts in public opinion, there have been um, uh, constant undertones that have um, uh, um, travelled um, uh, with the policies uh, since 1992 when the Labor government, the then Labor government, introduced mandatory detention. And constant throughout this period have been the messages that Australia's borders are at risk of massive inundation. Australia itself is at risk of harm, manipulation and exploitation in some way from people arriving by boat, either by the refugees themselves or by the people smugglers. And finally, that Australia is incredibly generous in its resettlement of refugees. There have been other um, uh, constant undertones, but those are, those are um, a number of, of um, uh, the quite prominent ones. And the ability of successive governments to control the narrative has been enabled by making invisible and inaudible the refugees and their stories, by incarcerating them in high security remote prisons, denying information to journalists and advocates, and now increasingly threatening to punish and imprison those who dare to speak out on the conditions in Australian run immigration detention centres. The recent High Court decision uh, uh, to clear the way, which cleared the way for the Australian Government to return 267 asylum seekers to detention in Nauru, uh, in Nauru and Manus Island have highlighted the critical role that the media has in reporting on these issues. We have seen these people through that reporting given a human face. The photos of the 37 babies born in Australia have created a human connection and the response by ordinary Australians, churches, and most state and territory governments has shown the importance of that connection in challenging the narrative that the Australian government is so desperate to keep intact. We're very fortunate to have a great panel of speakers tonight. First Dog on the Moon, Ben Doherty, Paul Bongiorno and Dr Michelle Dunbreen. 
And our panel can speak with first-hand experience on the challenges of accessing information and reporting on what is happening in Australia's detention centres. The forced turn backs of boats and the administration or maladministration of Australia's refugee and asylum seeker policy. I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr Michelle Dunbreen. Michelle was a print journalist in Australia, Britain and Ireland for more than, uh, for more than 20 years. She recently completed a PhD on the Australian media's coverage of Aboriginal opposition to the Northern Territory intervention. Michelle is currently a lecturer and researcher at the News and Media Research Centre at the University of Canberra and is also a member of the Refugee Action Committee. Please welcome Michelle Dunbarine. Hello. Um, so as Sophie said, my name is Michelle. Um, I'm an economic migrant and I'm also, um, <laughs> I'm also an active member of uh, the Canberra Refugee Action Committee. I work in the, uh, alongside some others in the media working group. Um, there are all kinds of working groups within RAC and uh, we encourage you to become involved if you're, if you're not already. So um, I'll be giving a very brief overview from an academic research perspective of the two main themes of this evening the role and importance of language choices in the asylum seeker discourse or conversation, as I like to call it, between government, the news media and the public, and the difficulty that the secrecy and whistleblower policy and legislation poses for journalists trying to report on these issues. And in doing so, I'll focus on the examples of the use of the term illegals to refer to asylum seekers who arrive by boat, and the difficulties of getting asylum seekers as sources in news stories. Um, first language. The news media plays a very powerful and necessary role in the processes of policy formulation, implementation and legitimization in not only holding the government to account but in conveying government thinking, public opinion, popular opinion and dissenting voices. Um, so as I said, we can think of it as a conversation in which the news media plays the roles both of participant and facilitator. Language matters, as Sophie said, how we label someone socially positions them it defines them. When we're mislabeled, we're socially positioned or defined as doing something other than what we're actually doing. What, whether we call a person an asylum seeker or illegal matters. It's not illegal to seek asylum, as you all know, regardless of how one arrives in the country. When the former immigration minister, Scott Morrison, directed last year that public servants refer to asylum seekers arriving by boat as illegals, a factually incorrect label, this can be seen as a deliberate move to position them as something other than they are and to delegitimize and demonize them. So when government spokespeople refer to asylum seekers as illegals in their media statements, this enters the discourse, the conversation, as shorthand, as common sense, as fact. There is a substantial body of research literature attesting to the interplay of government pronouncements and popular opinion. Um, I'm not going to call it public opinion, because in democratic theory, public opinion needs to be arrived at by informed discussion and debate, and our government is stymieing that possibility. The research literature shows us that language choices are vitally important in facilitating an informed conversation. Um, before I go on to talk about the democratic role of the news media, I want to acknowledge that there are other, way, other ways of practicing journalism but I'm, I'm going to be concentrating on the news media that wishes to bring to light uh, the facts of our asylum seeker policy. So on to the second theme of this forum, the difficulties faced by journalists trying to report on asylum seeker issues. The role of the news media in a democracy has been conceptualized in a number of ways, and I'm going to talk about the ideal of the fourth estate and the role of the public sphere. Australian journalists in general say they want to play a role in holding the government to account. The survey research literature shows us that Australian journalists, when asked, in general, say that they hold the ideal of the fourth estate dear, that they believe that their role is not only information dissemination and facilitating what I'm referring to as the conversation, but that they feel they're also obliged and keen to hold the government to account. And there have been many great examples of that in relation to asylum seeker policy, particularly lately. When we think of the news media as a public sphere, its democratic function is at a, as a forum for informed discussion and debate, accessible by all, whereby something like public opinion can be formed. 
Of course, the Australian news media does not always, some would say does not often, operate as either the fourth estate or a public sphere, but the research shows us that the will among journalists is there. The secrecy and spin of asylum seeker legislation and policy is a serious obstacle to that ambition, not least because they preclude the inclusion of asylum seeker voices in the conversation. The journalist source relationship is central to the news production process. There would be no news without it. Yet our government conceals sources from journalists. News sources function as either story catalysts or means of story verification. However, as Sophie mentioned, the refugees and asylum seekers are concealed in offshore camps. The journalism visa fee, the fee for um, accessing Nauru, for example, is $8,000. That's just for the application. Journalists aren't entitled to a refund. So that um, dissuades media companies and individual journalists from seeking a visa in the first place. There's only been one granted so far. That's to Chris Kenny at The Australian. Whistleblowers, whistleblowers, whistleblowers as, a, and I'd like to say, for all his faults, Chris Kenny has actually verified Abian's story and shown Peter Dutton up to be a liar. So, um, I don't know, it's a, it's a mystery as to how that wasn't taken further. So, um, whistleblowers as sources face two-year jail sentences, and we've got some great whistleblowers in our community, and we should be all very grateful to them for taking this risk. Very brave people. Um, and as was shown this week by Paul Farrell at The Guardian, um, the AF and other journalists, the Australian Federal Police have been employed to investigate um, the sources of stories that when journalists are producing sources about, uh, stories about our asylum seeker policy. And then there are, there's the issue of advocates. Advocates' credibility is routinely undermined. They're routinely called liars. And you see that blown up this week when there was a mistake about how old a child who was sexually abused was. Um, So, um, when there are serious attempts to deny journalists access to all but government spokespeople as sources, and often even the denial of access to government spokespeople as sources, then this is a deliberate disruption of democracy. It's not just undemocratic, it's anti-democratic. But I'm guessing that you know that already. And this is, um, if anybody's interested in this issue about Australian journalism culture and how they hold the fourth estate role dear, these are some references here, and it's also come out of a recent research, or an ongoing research project at the University of Canberra called New Beats. So that's it from me. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Michelle. And I should mention that the Refugee Action Committee is very uh, pleased that uh, the University of Canberra News and Media Research Centre are co-sponsoring this event. So we um, very much welcome their involvement in, in this event. I'd like now to welcome Ben Doherty. Uh, ben is the immigration correspondent for Guardian Australia. He's a former foreign correspondent for The Guardian and the Sydney Morning Herald, and is a two-time Walkley Award winner. Ben has written extensively on Australia's refugee policies and about the conditions on, on uh, offshore detention centres on Manus Island and Nauru. As a Thomson Reuters Fellow at the University of Oxford in 2015, Ben wrote an article which is particularly pertinent for tonight's focus, titled Call Me Illegal, The Semantic Struggle Over Seeking Asylum in Australia. Please welcome Ben Doherty. Can I start by saying thank you, Sophie. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak and thank you all um, very much for coming. I think this is such an issue of, of such fundamental importance to Australia and it really is important that the public discourse doesn't just happen on the TV or in newspaper columns, but it happens you know, in the forum, I suppose. Um, and it's, it's so important that, that people understand the public discourse that is going on about this issue. Um, I'm going to keep my remarks very brief um, uh, tonight. Um, you've all given up uh, a, a weeknight to come here and talk about this, and, and certainly I think journos are often very good at talking, but not perhaps so good at listening, and it'd be nice to hear you know, what, what the room thinks about these issues and those things. So I'll, I'll be very quick. My my experience or, or my, my history coming to this came from, um, as, as Sophie mentioned, my work history. I was a foreign correspondent for about seven years, um, working for, in Southeast Asia for The Guardian, then South Asia for, uh, for, for Fairfax, 
Um, and I reported a lot about, I came at this from the other end almost, in that I reported about uh, forced migration and, and, and asylum seekers um, from the leaving end. So it was Hmong people leaving Laos, it was Rohingya leaving uh, Burma, now Myanmar, uh, Hazara leaving Central Afghanistan and Pakistan, Tamil men getting on boats from, from northern Sri Lanka. Um, and I, was, I came back to Australia and, um, and I found I'd arrived at this incredibly divided and, and polemic debate where, where the language was designed to dehumanise, was designed to distance um, the people at the centre of the, the, this issue. And, um, and it, it really felt to me like the, the, the debate, people were so uh, dug into their positions and, and language was almost used as a sort of weapon to attack the other side. And there was a great, the, the actual debate wasn't occurring because basically the, the, the language was used in a, in a sort of polemic fashion rather than to to explain anything. Um, and I found this a really curious thing that it was, it was such a controversial issue. Um, and it has been for, 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 for quite a while in Australia because when you, when you think about it, almost the most quintessentially Australian thing you can do is to turn up, in this, to, turn up to this place in a boat. It's, it's <laughs> you know, it, no, I'm, I'm, I'm quite serious. More than playing cricket, more than mateship, more than barbecues, more than fair go, all of these tropes about Australia. The most Australian thing you can do is to turn up here on a boat without telling anyone you're coming. It's, <laughs> it's, it, is, it is what has happened in this place for sort of 60,000 years. So it's, it was, it's been really interesting that, that, that since you know, the first Indigenous Australians came, since you know, British settlements, since the 10 pound pomp, since you know, the, the Indo-Chinese um, be, began arriving in, in the mid-1970s, this has been what's happened in Australia, but the language Certainly since, if, if we go back to, to 1976, which my paper did, you can see the way the language has changed since that time, and it has been quite extraordinary. And I do appreciate that language change, languages evolve naturally, and, and words change, and they take on different connotations, but this has not been some natural evolution of language. This has been a deliberate construction, a deliberate um, manipulation, and a distortion of this issue, and a, and a, and a deliberate changing of people's understandings and perceptions about what is happening here, that, that this issue is being presented to the Australian people no longer as an issue of humanitarian concern or of international legal obligation. Instead, this is, a, this is an issue of national security. This is a border protection matter. And it, it, it has fundamentally changed the way Australians have looked at this issue. Um, for my paper, I, I interviewed Chris Evans, and I'll, I'll just give the example here. And he, he sort of said, and it, it also goes to the nature of this issue, that the government all, often owns a lot of the information here. This is something that happens a long way away. It's happening on the high seas. People are taken to remote detention centres. They're taken offshore. So it's very hard to know what's happening. And the information is often in the hands of a very few people. So the government have a great deal of power in controlling the way information is presented. But if the government comes to you and says, today the Immigration Department rescued 40 asylum seekers from the Indian Ocean, that's an event that happened. The government can also say, today Operation Sovereign Borders and the Australian Border Force stopped 40 illegals coming into this country. What happened is, act, is, 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 is the identical, uh, exactly the same thing happened, but the way it's presented is completely different. And I think there needs to be a consciousness in, in the Australian discourse about the way these issues are presented and, and about the way that language is used and these narratives are used to change public perception and understanding. A very quick pot of history, because I've talked longer than I thought. This was the earliest example I could find of um, let's, boat people was, was the term that came uh, in, in the 1970s. Um, this is in the Canberra Times. Uh, they got the date wrong, I think. It was also about two days after, or three days after it happened. And you can see the language is, is completely neutral. A 17 metre South Vietnamese fishing boat arrived in Darwin last night with five men seeking political asylum. Um, as a newspaper editor, I go, that's a really dull intro, but it's, it's, you know, it's factual. It's, it's page nine or page ten. You know, like, th this, is, this is not a... I appreciate this is the first boat, but, but the, the sort of... The way language has changed, this is Michael McKellar, um, a former member for Warringa, um, and, and, and they, they, this is the language of the immigration minister at the time. I'll let you read it, but, but you can see that you know, words like sanctuary, words like international obligations, freely entered into. Um, this is not the sort of language we hear in the asylum debate today. Um, my dear friend Brenda Nicholson, who I bumped into in the gallery today, um, sorry he gets rolled under a bus here. Um, uh, Abbott slams boat people as unchristian. Smashing people, smuggling, poor old David, he cops it as well. Um, cheers, not so worried about. Um, uh, <laughs> Rod, I'm kidding, this is a, old Chatham House, isn't it? Um, 
Uh, RUD's open door to illegals, the, the, the term of illegals, operation to stop votes like a war, this, this language of war. Um, I think, you know, since I've written this paper, one of the things that's been really interesting, and you know, if, if I ever got to, to sit down and write something again, looking at something like the Let Them Stay campaign has been really interesting in, in terms of how effective that has been in changing the nature of the narrative. Um, and it's been incredibly powerful um, in terms of, of sort of reframing the debate, it, the, to make it again one about the humanitarian objective, uh, humanitarian concerns and those international legal obligations. Um, just, I'm gonna run through these very, very quickly. Um, this, as I say, is, is a sort of potted history for my paper. If you're ever seized by a particularly intractable bout of insomnia, I can highly recommend my paper to you. <laughs> it's it's 25,000 words of this, so you'll love it. Um, uh, the 1970s, uh, uh, as we talked about before, um, Michael McKellar's words, but, but public concern started to impact upon government language, and we see language around you know, coming in a boat is unfair, and this idea of a queue jumper, that there's something improper about getting on a boat, starts to emerge. The early 90s, 1992, as we've mentioned, um, illegals previously had, had been used to describe people who had a visa and had overstayed, but it became to be used by people turning up um, seeking asylum by boat, and um, along with, um, and very closely linked, I have to say, to the policy of mandatory detention became this idea of, of illegals. And I would argue that, that illegals is not a sort of corollary um, of the policy, but actually that, that language is a fundamental part of it. If someone is illegal, it gives you, as a government, not only the right, but almost the imprimatur to, to detain someone. But if someone's an asylum seeker, then, then what are they doing in detention? So the language actually is a, is a really fundamental foundation for the policy, and I, I think that needs to be understood. It's not just a political do tool or a political device. It is actually fundamental to the way this issue is approached politically. 2001, I don't think I need to go into Tampa and asylum as terror, uh, children overboard, pipeline for terrorists, all of those sort of things. Um, and 2013, asylum in the language of war. Certainly, we all of a sudden we had Operation Sovereign Borders, this militarisation of the language. We had press conferences conducted by four-star generals in uniform, um, uh, which when you think about it, and you know, I've, I've, I've given this, this uh, presentation or, or, or similar to this um, uh, across the UK and uh, in Europe, and people are staggered by this. People are absolutely flabbergasted that, that a civilian democratically elected government would have a general running this government program. And it is, it, it's an extraordinary thing. Uh, the line at the bottom, if we were at war, we wouldn't be giving out information, we are at war, is a line from um, Mr Abbott. Um, now, all of this what will go on, and I, I won't continue on the, um, uh, on, on the, the, the rest because it just goes on and on and on. Um, <laughs> but I suppose, my, <laughs> really does. Um, my, my paper sort of went to the point, and, and, and as, a, as a sort of practitioner of journalism, that I think journalism, we have these sort of shibboleths in journalism around you know, impartiality um, and accuracy and balance, and you, know, you can argue whether we get that right or not. But, but I also think that there's a further responsibility that, that, that we need to, to adopt, and that's the responsibility to question. Um, and to be cynical in the sort of, the, you know, the, the original sense of the word, in that we need to question the narratives that, that we are presented with, whether they be, be by leaders um, or, or other people in the public discourse, narratives that are loaded or pejorative or are distortions of the actual event, we need to be very careful about. And I'm not saying that, um, I don't go so far as to, to be prescriptive, I suppose, in saying you must use this language or that language, but I think just an awareness of the power of language and the way it is used to change people's perceptions is hugely important, not only for media practitioners, but for the government and for people like this in, in, in the forum, you know, in, in the public debate. It's, language is important because um, you know, words, words make worlds. It is hugely fundamental. And um, thank you very much for listening to me tonight. Much appreciated. <laughs> Thanks very much, Ben. That's great. Our third speaker is uh, Paul Bongiorno. Paul writes regularly for the Saturday paper, is a frequent commentator on ABC Radio National Breakfast and a contributing editor for 10 News. He hosted Meet the Press from 1996 through to 2012. And in 2014, Paul was made a member of the Order of Australia in recognition of his significant service to the print and broadcast media as a journalist, political commentator and editor. And can I say, as a regular listener of RN uh, Breakfast, I'd like to personally thank Paul for his comments each morning. They lift my morning. So please welcome Paul Bongiorno. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you all for being here. Um, I do feel that uh, a lot of my thunder has been uh, stolen. A lot of the points that uh, I wanted to make uh, have been made uh, very well. 
uh, and uh, with humour. So look, um, I'm going to give a couple of practical examples of uh, what we have to deal with uh, in the media and trying to get to the story. I think a lot of it is pretty obvious. The most obvious, you might remember Scott Morrison, uh, Operation Sovereign Borders completely militarised, and that is because it was designed by Major General Jim Molan, a distinguished Australian um, military veteran who the Americans actually got to help run them uh, the Iraq War. Uh, and he applied the same principles of, uh, of um, military uh, secrecy and the military imperative to Operation Sovereign Borders. Um, Scott Morrison got the military aspect right, but he got the political aspect wrong when he decided that um, there'd be no comment on anything to do with asylum seekers uh, for six days, and on the seventh day he would officially not comment because it was, uh, <laughs> because it was on, on water matters. And that's still, uh, that's still the case. Look, um, I'd, I'd just like to set up um, a, a couple of things. I'll, I'll tell you one other thing. In, in 2007, it was um, a, a, a boat, and I, I tried to Google this today to remind myself, because I remember uh, reporting it, um, a boat with, with, which I thought was Vietnamese uh, asylum seekers, but I think they might have been uh, Chinese, actually got into Fanny Bay in Darwin. And... Um, the um, news director in uh, 10 Sydney rang and said, oh, we, we want to cover this story. And um, uh, he said, can you ring our stringer up in, in Darwin? And uh, um, seven have agreed with us that we'll, um, we'll split the cost on putting a helicopter up. You know? And I said, fine. So I rang the, um, the stringer up in Darwin and uh, we duly booked the helicopter, but we were told that the federal government had closed the airspace. <laughs> and of course, um, the airspace was also closed, by the way, uh, during the Tampa operation because that's when we as a nation declared, literally declared war on the Tampa Mercy ship. Um, but to put a bit of, I guess, political perspective that I'd like to share with you, and I, I have um, a little um, idea or thesis that I want to um, tell you before I uh, try to escape with my life. Um, David Marr and Marion Wilkinson wrote a book, Dark Victory, which they published uh, in 2003. It was basically about the 2001 election. Uh, the blurb on the book, when I read it, I said, I'm going to share that with everybody, even though I know you all feel it and agree with it. The, the book says, uh, the blurb about the book says, they, that is the Australian government, they put lives at risk, they twisted the law, they drew the military into the heart of the election campaign, they muzzled the press, they misused intelligence services, defied the United Nations, antagonised Indonesia and bribed poverty-stricken Pacific states. They closed Australia to refugees and won a mighty election victory. And it's this that I want to home in on because, you see, they did win a mighty election victory and the the opinion polls show that there is overwhelming public support in this country for stopping the boats. And the thesis I'd like to share with you is that the obsession with secrecy certainly serves a political purpose for the government, but it serves another purpose for us as Australians. It hides the truth of ourselves from ourselves. We're, it's great that the boats have been stopped because they're not coming anymore and I really, really don't want to know how you did it. And of course, when you do it in remote uh, uh, waters and in remote parts of the globe, you know, in... in you know, broken-assed countries like Nauru and, and, uh, and Papua New Guinea and Manus Island, the media tries to get there and it occasionally succeeds in getting there. If you do get there and you get caught, you'll be just uh, kicked out straight away. And it's done, even if you get there, it's enormously expensive to get there. But um, the point that uh, Ben made uh, before, that this secrecy was imposed also because John Howard knew he was playing with fire. The last thing he wanted, particularly with the Tampa, was for any of us to see that this intervention had an enormous and immediate cruel impact on real men and uh, women and children. 
And the image that was put up before, which was published in the Murdoch papers, um, of the 433 people on the deck, none of whom were near death, which we know was a lie. A pregnant woman was dehydrating and near death. Just one, the book spells all that out. Um, it was the first mate on the Tampa that used the internet to send those pictures out to, to, the, to the news media. Uh, because I, I don't know whether you heard an interview on, uh, it was on news radio actually last week, uh, on the day that the High Court made its decision, the fact that the refugee advocates had the gumption to put the images of the 37 babies on the front pages of the paper, and, and, and the fact that the editors, the Fairfax editors, thought that, that they should and would do that, uh, just brought home that these are real children, and that, by the way, Australia, you've signed the convention on children, you know, and that convention says that that children must always be put first. And of course, there are a number of conventions that we have signed: um, the Refugee Convention, the Human Rights Convention, the, right, uh, the Torture Convention, and the Rights of the Child. Why have we signed them as a nation? Would anyone dare say, "Oh, we're going to unsign them"? No, because we are compassionate. Therefore, we don't want to be told, we don't want to see, and we don't want to know. Um, uh, you know, what, what is being done in our name. Um, you, you might, um, I think Noel Pearson calls the, uh, the way we treated Aborigines in the first uh, century and a half of the, of the settlement, he calls it the great amnesia. Well, this is what we've got today, the great amnesia. And, and um, I, I know um, I don't have to battle with uh, news directors anymore every day, but, but it is often a battle to get a refugee or asylum uh, seeker story up in, um, in, in 10 news. Um, unless there's something burning down, you know, unless there's some atrocity or something like that that we can get, get to. Uh, other broader issues about um, what does this say or, or do, what are we doing, uh, uh, they say, oh, no, forget that, you know, no, that's boring, you know. Uh, uh, so um, how, how, to, um, how to cure this amnesia is, is, is the real battle. How to, how to admit that uh, the way politics in our democracy works is it appeals either to our darker angels or our brighter angels. And unfortunately, when you try to motivate voters appealing, appealing to people's darker angels and their deepest fears and their prejudices is the way to go. And um, uh, often the media is blamed for letting this happen, but the media really is a mirror image of a society. It, it, it shows us back to ourselves. And, and I think that um, that's you know, uh, something uh, worth thinking about. Now, um, the other thing too is I'd, I'd just like to um, share, well, what about a solution? What, what, what can we um, do about this? And there's no doubt we, that we should set about redefining exactly what the problem is and assuring the nation that ditching offshore processing won't, in fact, open the floodgates. I wonder if we'll ever get a political leader now, once the compact, the political compact was broken in 2001, to do just that. Um, the other interesting thing, um, the Jesuit priest and lawyer, Father Frank Brennan, wrote recently that, uh, that maybe we should keep the turnbacks policy if our government can show uh, that it's that uh, it is not only confident that it's internationally legal, what they're doing, but they are doing it. But then we have to realise that this is only part of a broader uh, suite of measures that are needed. We spend $1 billion a year, $1 billion a year, running the Pacific Solution. Why can't we spend some of that money in, a, in a better dealing and putting resources the way of Malaysia and Indonesia, for example? Um, so uh, that's just uh, a, a couple of thoughts. Um, it, it is interesting that um, it, it is interesting that that our ability to to um, not only challenge. You see, have you have you noticed that uh, Sarah Hansen Young is often dismissed as nothing more than a bleeding heart? 
what's wrong with a bleeding heart? I mean, does compassion and, and feeling for people who suffer, does that mean anything in the compassionate nation? These are some of the issues and the problems that we've got to deal with. One last thought about mainstream journalists, of which I've been one for 42 years, so I should be a pariah in here, I know. But um, that is that none of us in the mainstream own a television network or own a mainstream newspaper or, or a mainstream uh, radio uh, network. And um, we, we can only hope that our owners realise that the role of the fourth estate, uh, you know, is... Did I do that? <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I get the message, you know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, is to discomfort the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. And just to um, uh, follow on from the comment that Paul made about um, how certain um, uh, labels uh, take on um, uh, pejorative meanings like bleeding heart, well, now it's about being an advocate. And an advocate is a byword for a liar and someone who, who seeks to, to um, um, you know, um, distort the truth. So, um, welcome to advocacy. So, um, um, our last speaker uh, is Mr. First Dog on the Moon, or often simply known as just First Dog. Um, First Dog is a political cartoonist for, Ga for Guardian Australia and also hosts, hosts a wonderful weekly radio segment on Radio National Sunday Extra. First Dog's cartoons frequently cover the brutal and often bizarre aspects of Australia's refugee policy, and it was for one of these that he was awarded the 2012 Walkley Award for Best Political Cartoon. <laughs> Please welcome Mr First Dog. Uh, no. All right. Good evening. Hello. Thank you. <sighs> Isn't this nice? I mean, it's not nice. It's terrible um, why we're all here, but it's nice that we're all able to be here and you're all clearly, clearly lovely. Um, I am First Dog on the Moon. Thank you for, for asking me here along this evening. Uh, it really is, as previous speakers have said, an honour to be involved in such an important project. Uh, thank you very much to the, uh, the Refugee Action Committee um, and I hope some good can come of this stuff. We live in terrible times. I mean, in Australia we've always lived in terrible times, but well, you know what I mean. Um, one of the things I found uh, so remarkable about spin and secrecy with regard to asylum seekers um, since, since Tony Abbott came to government, um, because politicians have always lied uh, and they've always spun stuff, but Tony Abbott and Scott Morrison turned it into a particularly brutal art form, um, which Peter Dutton and Malcolm Turnbull are continuing. Um, how did we get here? Uh, I mean, I think Paul was right to say that you can't actually blame all of the mainstream journalists, some of them, but um, uh, for a long while it seemed that mainstream journalists weren't asking the right questions, but even when they do ask the right questions, they don't get the answers now. Um, I thought letting Chris Kenny off the hook was a bit... Um, a bit much, but anyway. <laughs> um, so, like I said, I have prepared uh, nothing particularly helpful. I'm just going to talk about some of my cartoons and uh, this one. Um, now, I've I've defaced this this picture, which is terrible, um, because this is no, this is. This is serious. Uh, this is actually, this is Ben Doherty, who, <laughs> who didn't just write a 25,000 word paper that would, apparently, I'm sure I'm looking forward to getting a hold of that and reading it. Um, the gentleman goes, goes to Manus and goes, well, when he's allowed, I'm sure he'd go to Nauru and goes, um, and to the point where they put this poster up uh, at the Manus Detention Centre. Yeah, without the whiskers. Yes, yes. <laughs> no. Uh, but that says, if you see this man lurking, I'm assuming, um, don't give him any information. Um, because there's a journalist from, you know, a mainstream media organisation. <laughs> Let's all just take a moment to, to think about how good The Guardian is. 
<laughs> it's pretty good. Um, anyway, so so Ben Ben is 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 one of my heroes because I I whenever I have a difficult question I I, I will I will go to Ben um, and he's always got. Um, He's always got good answers. And one of the things that Ben and the other journalists, and there's a bunch of, there's a really good team there, um, they're very careful about making sure that the stories are told properly, um, that they're accurate, um, that they're respectful. Um, and so I feel pretty lucky that I ended up um, being, their, being their cartoonist. Um, the... Uh, the uh, <laughs> it's, it's a good noise. Um, I um, I'm going to leave the suggestions and the ideas to the experts. Uh, one of the challenges I face, it's a, it's a little one, um, is that people expect me to defend my position because I have occasionally articulate opinions in my cartoons. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And sometimes people say, "Well, you know, what are we going to do? Are we going to are we going to let them all in? Are we going to what? You know, what do you reckon?" And I, well, if it's in the comments, I won't reply because why would you? But um, <laughs> I always say, oh, "I'm a cartoonist," you know, um, and they say, "Well, that's a bit of a cop out." And I say. I don't care because I'm a cartoonist. Um, and it's if you want, I mean, Julia Gillard didn't put a cartoonist on that special working group to figure out how to actually solve the problem. It would have been funny. <laughs> I reckon I would have been pretty good, but no. You know, so um, this particular cartoon, which I, uh, I did, oh, was it 2011, 2009, too long ago that this is still relevant. Um, and I won't read the whole thing, but it's this bit, the let them all come, let them all come and ruin our way of life and overrun our greed and our sorrow and fill our streets with their undrowned children and <laughs> trample our tenuous grasping spirits with their tired dusty feet, terrible dusty feet that have been who knows where. <laughs> let, them, let them bring their strange ways and their bad ideas. We'll be right. Um, because we will. And, and Ben's right, the, the most Australian thing is to rock up in a boat without being announced, but also to say, oh, look, we'll be right. Because we could do it, we just don't want to. Um, so, uh, now I, uh, look, I don't want to, I, I want a Walkley for this one. <laughs> just, just the one, though. Um, and uh, I, I have to say, uh, I was quite surprised. Um, this essentially, uh, probably not as much as Tim Blair was, but um, this cartoon for me sums up the kind of circular rhetoric. Um, and I'm, I don't know whether you can read it, I'm not going to read it. You can't read it. <laughs> it's pretty good. Uh, it won a Walkley. Oh, I don't. No, no. Let me help you. No, but wait, how did you get in the water? How do I know this isn't some kind of trick? Glub. And what if I do help you and then a whole bunch of other people come along as well and they're drowning, they might expect me to help them as well and then where will I be? And then we, we jump ahead to the wrong cartoon. Uh, <laughs> won't saving you just create a dependency? How will you learn to save yourself from drowning <laughs> next time? I just can't risk it, I'm sorry, but it's for your own good. And anyway, you shouldn't have fallen in the water in the first place. Did you miss the public information campaign? <laughs> there were ads on the telly and everything. You really only have yourself to blame. It is such a terrible tragedy, but there's only so much one person can do. <laughs> Which I, um, <laughs> well, thank you. That is very kind of you. Um, so, <laughs> oh, stand up. Who was it? Oh, <laughs> uh, all right. I think mine's turned off. Um, so one of the things that comes up on a fairly regular basis as a cartoonist is, and I don't know how 
how this mob do it when they have to just treat it seriously. Uh, I mean, it's hard to go, all right, here's a terrible story, Abiyan and Chris Kenny. Um, this is Chatham House Rules, by the way. Um, and if you don't know what that means, Google it before you tweet about it. Um, uh, sorry. I, I'm, I'm a bit excited. And I'm, I'm speaking quickly. Um, so this cartoon is about, you can see him there, uh, Biff Bootface. Guess who don't sue? Um, and he's spending some time here. Uh, this is the mysterious case of the alleged rape refugee on Guano <coughs> Island, which is how uh, rape refugee was how one of the headlines, I think it was in The Australian, uh, described her. Um, and it's basically because I put this one in because we're talking about um, spin and secrecy and the extraordinary um, situation we have where uh, the only person allowed on now Rue to report on it is Malcolm Turnbull's former chief of staff or media advisor, I think he was. Uh, who now is a columnist at The Australian, um, who I'm sure thinks of himself uh, firmly, uh, literally as a journalist, but I, I don't know uh, <laughs> if the rest of us do. Um, and I was, you know, I'm shocked that the that, that senior lecturers at the University of Canberra uh, 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 saying for his many faults he did prove that the Abiyan story um, was true. Now, I wouldn't know that because I can't read anything he writes. Um, <laughs> And the reality is, it may be true and it may be not, but if we're waiting for Chris Kenny to tell us, how <laughs> fucked are we? <laughs> All right? how, how did we get here? How, how did we get here? So this is just a series of, of probably not particularly funny pictures of him going, oh no, sorry, Biff Bootface, going to, um, going to Abiyan's I don't know, hut, that's the shittest hut ever that I've drawn there. Um, and... <laughs> is, is that something you want to share with the rest of us? <laughs> um, and what happened uh, is that he rocked up to Abiyan's hut, the woman who'd been sexually assaulted, um, and then brought back here and I think then taken back to Nauru um, and it's just the most terrible story, and I have, my job is to draw funny pictures about it, so I hope you all feel sorry for me. It actually, uh, you know, it, it, is, it can be quite difficult. I'm not expecting any sympathy at all. I have a fantastic job, um, and I'm not complaining, but it's just a really weird thing to have to do. So anyway, he rocks up to her hut um, with the police and says, oh, uh, uh, these unexpected police said you'd be happy to speak to me again as any woman who reports an assault on Guano Island is treated very well and not left half naked in a police station for hours or threatened with the charge of making a false complaint. To which she replies, well, when you put it like that. Now, I originally just had him rocking up with the police, but apparently, coincidentally, the Nauruan police turned up to Abiyan's place of residence. Hut is probably not fair because I haven't seen it, I don't know. Um, at exactly the same time as Biff Bootface, um, and being, being the serious journalist that he is, um, went and, Chatham House rules, uh, went and procured an interview somehow we don't know. Uh, although if you asked, and he threatened to sue Pamela Kerr, who I've drawn down here as an avocado. <laughs> uh, and then after I'd finished it, I was like, oh no, advocate. Avocado, people will think, that's a dumb joke. <laughs> that sort of stuff happens to me all the time. <laughs> anyway, so he threatened to sue a lot of people about their opinions of his going to Nauru and expressing his opinion. And the whole thing is just a terrible bloodbath and, and he used that picture of him as his Twitter avatar for a little while. So the world is a strange place. Um, now, I'll, I'm probably taking hours and I should uh, probably hurry up, but this one, oh my God's sake, this one, this is the camp that John built. And these are the 37 babies that are being sent to live in the camp that John built. This is the, uh, this actually is, this is the five-year-old child who will be returned along with the 37 babies that are being sent to live in the camp that John built. 
and down here, this is the person who raped the five-year-old child who will be returned along with the 37 babies that are being sent to live as a cancer John Bill. You get where I'm going with this. However, the ABC buggered it up. I was going to, I was going to win a Walkley with this one too. <laughs> and um, no, seriously, I was. Uh, and, well, I was going to enter it anyway. Um, I'm never going to win another Walkley, but that's not the point. The point is that the ABC got that story wrong and Michael Pizzullo, who's up for the possibly the worst person in history award, and I know it's a, <laughs> it's a strong field. He's the secretary of the Department of Immigration and Border Protection. Went to sentiment esti sen sentiment estimates, Senate estimates and said it, there wasn't a five-year-old boy and there wasn't a rape. Um, and the media are, are making things up. To which I responded, sitting at home in front of my TV watching Senate estimates, which is a bit sad, well, how the fuck are we supposed to know? You know, because how many assaults go unreported? How many terrible diabolical things happen on, on Manus and Nauru that we don't hear about or we only hear part of? Um, and again, I was talking to, to Mr Doherty about that and he said, look, that, that was a terrible mistake by the ABC and it kind of, um, it, it, because in part, it, it makes journalists look like they, they make things up and, 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 and are, being, are being advocates when actually they're probably just, you know, trying to be nice. And, I mean, you know, it's not News Corp, uh, so, so we don't make things up. And, um, <laughs> but it's like, it's, it's this matter of degree where we can say, well, actually, the child, there was an assault and the child was possibly older than 10 uh, and it wasn't actually a rape. So, and it's just, it's just, anyway, so at the bottom of this cartoon I wrote, I'm not sure I can do this anymore. And a few people said, oh, I, are you going to kill yourself? Um, <laughs> I got to the point. And it's, it's, I'm OK. I'm not going to do that, so don't worry about me. But, um, and that was a question not just for me, but for everybody who reads my cartoons, which how, in fact, do we get up every day? How, how do you get up every day and report this stuff? Um, and, and, you know, um, and I want to do a cartoon about that, which, which will fix everything, um, how, how we do self-care. And I asked Con from the ASRC, and he said, self-care is a political act, um, which I thought was great, because I, <laughs> you could take that a long way, uh, <laughs> and it will be very luxurious and relaxing and political to, you know, go and stay in a nice hotel or a series of... Massages. Anyway, uh, a lot of it is about how do we how do we feel, um, and, and what are we going to do? And joining the RAC is pretty good. Coming along with this sort of stuff uh, is pretty good. Have I have, am I way over time or just a bit over time? Oh, sort of skating on the edge. Skating on the edge. All right. I'll just do a couple more. These are Australian Border Force medals, which they apparently do have. Uh, the, this is the the Predatory Excellence Medal for services to encouraging child sexual abuse and to fostering an environment where it can take place unimpeded and unreported. And this is the golden shut the fuck up. Sorry for the swearing, by the way. Uh, the recipient of this medal has shown resilience and fortitude by lying to Senate inquiries uh, while also bullying and intimidating whistleblowers into silence. Note the sewn lips here on Lady Justice. Uh, this is the love it or leave it lapel pin awarded to the Australian people for their courage and determination to put up with what's happening on Nauru and Manus because it's easier than having to think about anything more complicated. I love Australia and I hang a lot of shit on the Australian people and will you just harden up and take it because we still have a lot of work to do. Um, <laughs> and this one, the valorous Dutton button for bravery in the face of toddlers with mental health problems. <laughs> and it says, what, what happens on the island stays on the island. So. I won't go, oh man, this one, this, oh, this cartoon, this is based on a letter written by actual asylum seekers on actual Manus Island. Um, and the incredible thing about this is they're taking the piss, all right? Hello, Mr Malcolm Turnbull and Peter Dutton. Um, we've written to you before, we'd like to request something different this time. Uh, <laughs> the only difference is we're very costly for the Australian taxpayers now. Stop doing that, would you, God damn it? Um, and we'd like to give you some recommendations to stop the waste of this huge amount of money running Australia's rep ruining Australia's reputation and keep the Australian borders safe forever. One, can we get a Navy ship that you can put us all on board and dump us all in the ocean? 
HMAS is always available. A gas chamber, uh, Deckmill will do it with a new contract. Injection of a poison, IHMS will help for this. Those are the IHMS are the people who run the medical facilities, medical facilities on, on, on our, and the incredible thing about this is that, sure, I mean, they, they don't actually, I'm, I'm pretty confident they don't actually expect that Malcolm Turnbull will put them on a boat and throw them at sea or poison them, but chances are it would be preferable to what's happening now. So in the midst of all of that, so I got some flack for drawing this as a funny cartoon because I thought that was fucking hilarious and that's some of the bravest shit I've ever seen, to write that letter, um, uh, which is just like, uh, <laughs> Australia, thank you, Malcolm Turnbull. That's, if, I was a satir, if I was that good a satirist, I'd have, I'd have loads of Walkleys. Uh, <laughs> so so I'm, I'm going to stop now, but thank you very much. I don't, um, we were wanting to know if the use of the word illegal was challenged in the High Court. I don't think that was the issue that was being looked at at all in the High Court. No, it was, that the, the, you're talking M68, which has just happened, so that was more to do with, um, and I'm very careful not to pass the word to the justices of the High Court, um, uh, a, a, around Australia's constitutional um, ability to, 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 to establish and fund and, and direct offshore detention at sort of six, section 61 of the Constitution. Well, offshore processing by using detention to determine whether they are asylum seekers or refugees. The problem is that some of them have been waiting four years to be processed. So the gentleman over there. My question is to Paul. Um, just to introduce the question. Someone said to me once quite recently, just completely out of the blue, nothing to do with refugees, what's the thing that disappoints you the most? And I thought for a minute and I said, the thing that disappoints to me the most is to be passionate about something and being able to do nothing about it. Now, it seems to me that your comment that the vast majority of people in Australia support the current policy puts us in exactly that position. So what can you do about it? Oh, well, I, I think you keep going the way we, you are, you and we are, you know, we have to keep agitating, we have to keep uh, uh, seizing opportunities to try to shift the, the conversation and, uh, and um, try to prick consciences. And I'll um, just say a word as the um, indulgence of the chair. I mean, I think um, uh, where we can take heart is that this has been a bipartisan policy now for 22 years, and yet um, the polls continue to show that 24, round about, percent of the population still don't support the government policy. Now, that's not an insignificant... Obviously, it's not the majority, but it's not an insignificant number of people. And I think that's what we take heart to, and those are um, the people that we need to draw into activity. I'll take that as a comment. Thank you. Um, perhaps uh, to Paul, could you just enlarge a bit on what Father Brennan said about the possibility of still turning back to base but increasing our intake from the refugee camps as a, as a sort of a political uh, possibility, maybe? Because doing anything other than what they're doing now seems to be political. Uh, well, I, I, I think the, the point that was made, is, in a sense, was calling the government's bluff on, on turning back the boats. You know, if you say, um, it, it is clear, by the way, Andrew Metcalf, who was uh, the um, 
person head of the immigration department at the uh, and help design the original Pacific solution. He says turning back the boats as a concept is, is the most effective thing to do because people uh, lose heart if, they, if, they, if they're turned back. And the Malaysian solution was supposed to be a more humane way of doing it by sending them back to, or sending people to Malaysia with certain safeguards, we were told, and we would then take 600, you know, um, uh, processed refugees from, from Malaysia. Uh, the idea or, or the theory was that uh, this would um, this would uh, help um, this would use the deterrent value of turnbacks, but in a more humane way. And as we know, that solution, which we can all argue about, that was attacked by Tony Abbott and Scott Morrison, not from the right, but from the left, as not being compassionate enough. <laughs> It is, I mean, it, it's hard to talk about the Pacific sort of, um, it, it sort of differs from country to country, but certainly um, uh, in terms of local access to, to Manus on PNG, for instance, doesn't exist either. I've requested several times um, when I've been on Manus to get permission to go to Lombrum to, to, to go into the detention centre, and I've been rejected every time. And as far as I'm aware, no PNG journalists have been allowed. Um, on Nauru, in incredibly restrictive uh, reporting arrangements, um, and that's not unusual. Um, in, in other countries uh, across the Pacific. In terms of um, cooperation and assistance, um, there's not much, to be honest. Um, and there is a sense on Nauru that, uh, from journalists as well as others, that they sometimes get a pretty uh, a bad rap, that, that condemnation of the detention centre there or the, or the, you know, the regime is perceived as, 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 as sort of criticism of Nauru itself and, and Nauru people. So, um, it's probably something that, yeah, that could certainly improve. So the, this, yep. Um, I commend the uh, whistleblowers who risked two years imprisonment to speak about conditions on Marmus and on Nauru. But the government hasn't prosecuted anybody, <coughs> presumably because if you have, they have a court case, they'll generate huge publicity about what's <coughs> actually going on there. So do you think the government will actually prosecute public I think the Border Force Act has already been effective before there's been a prosecution in that it has had, um, and I'm, I'm sure of this because people have told me this, um, it has had a chilling effect on, on people who might have been willing to speak out feeling very much constrained and very concerned, and, and, and rightly so. I mean, this is, a, this is a very serious penalty they face. So I don't know that the Act was ever intended to lead to a, to a, you know, a, a, a stack of prosecutions. It's already had the impact of making people very wary of speaking. And, 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 and like you, I think it's in incredibly brave and incredibly important that people continue to speak out about it. But at the same time, I do appreciate it's a very serious risk they run. But we, we should also be extremely proud of the uh, our doctors and nurses who are speaking out now. say that's speculation. It's probably, you know, well-founded, but um, it's a separate, very much separate issues, I'd say. The Islamophobia definitely is linked into it, but the rest of it, not so sure. But you can see, like, uh, asylum seekers are always demonized for their religion, even though they're running away from ISIS, etc. Those regimes that we're told to fear from, you know, asylum seekers bringing Sharia law, etc. into Australia. Definitely they're demonized as, as Muslims. 
But um, yeah, the rest I can't say there's a link. Well, look, I have opinions about this. I think we've, we've had our Trump, and it was Tony Abbott. Um, uh, well, perhaps a combination of Tony Abbott and Clive Palmer. Um, and oh, I'm, I'm afraid that it, it, it can, yes. But, uh, uh, I mean, it wouldn't, Bernie Sanders would be fun. Um, <laughs> Wouldn't that be, that, you know, uh, that would be, that would be, oh, the Labour Party. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so can it get worse? Absolutely. Are people terrible and do they want to make loads of money? Uh, and is, is Rupert Murdoch, you know, having a great time? Yes. And it's, it's, it's pretty sad. I should say, I, I wasn't suggesting that Michelle was defending Chris Kenny. Um, <laughs> just that. Anytime anybody says anything nice about Chris Kenny, I, I get upset. Yeah, I'd just like to clarify that, just so, yeah. Basically, the Refugee Action Committee, I'm on the media group, and lately on Twitter, we've been trying to corner Chris Kenny into admitting that he corroborated Abian's story, because he did. I wasn't obviously ref um, defending his practice, but if you scrape the surface of all the stuff that he wrote, you'll see that he actually did report that Abby Ann said she had not refused a termination. And she ended up coming back to Australia because people like you objected to her treatment. So Chris Kenny, he's the only person who's been allowed onto Nauru and um, in no way defending him. But, you know, if we could get him on our side, how powerful would that be? <laughs> um, I think we got off tangent a little bit there. Um, uh, but. Just to the point, I actually think there's a dog is very funny, but um, uh, there is there is a really serious point there that, that people are you know very much you know dug into their trench of their positions, and I think there's sort of and and the figures are you know are probably a bit rubbery, but it might be 30% on one side, 30% on the other, and there's a great middle there. How many left? How many percent left? 40%. <laughs> um, but there, there is there's a great middle that this debate really washes over, and I think. Part of, part of the issue is that it is so divisive and so loaded and so polemic, and I'm, I'm sorry to hook into you here, Doc, but, but the idea of, you know, sort of attacking the other side and those sort of things, I don't think that, you know, calling the other side horrible or bastards or whatever, and, and I get that you operate in, in, a, in a different sphere and those things. There is a it's, culture war on, mate, <laughs> and it's time to choose sides. <laughs> <laughs> Sounding... <laughs> Sounding very, sounding very much like George W. Bush there, dog. Um, uh, but no, I, but I, 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 I really don't think that, that you convince people of your position by attacking them, by, by calling them names of these things. I, I, think, I think rational, passionate, but, um, but reasoned argument is, is, is the way to change public opinion. I, I'm, you know, people don't agree with me. But... Yeah. That, is, that is boring but true. <laughs> I'm only going to take two more questions because, as I said at the beginning, I am going to put two um, motions to the meeting. So this gentleman has had his hand up for a while. Sure. Yes, of course, Kerry. One of the things I think Michelle mentioned was that we as Australian people can comfort ourselves with the thought that even if we're being beastly to people we lock up on their own and Manus Island, we are generous towards genuine I believe that that isn't actually the case. Internationally, currently, we are not generous takers of refugees from the world's struggle spot. Maybe I'm wrong. If I'm right, how do we and how does the media draw more attention to that and perhaps not the proper way from the comfort level of Australia today? So the question was around questioning Australia's claim of generosity around uh, its international role in resettling refugees and um, if um, that is indeed just a, a fallacy, how can we draw attention to that? Well look, um, I, I think uh, 
I think it's important uh, that we have to understand that as a sovereign nation, uh, we do have um, an orderly immigration and refugee policy is clearly something that the, uh, the people expect uh, rightly. Part of the suite of measures that are being suggested, uh, and, and you might remember the uh, panel that Gillard set up, uh, their suggestion was that we should up our refugee in intake to 25,000, uh, which would give encouragement in inverted commas, I suppose, to um, people to um, you know, apply through UNHCR and would also encourage UNHCR to send more people our way. It is an intractable problem. We, we know now that there are over a million refugees in Libya, a million refugees in, in Turkey. You know, <clears throat> uh, So many have been displaced. Um, I saw a figure, and I don't know whether it's the current one, that something like 60 million in the world could, could uh, uh, be uh, legitimately called refugees. You know, we, we've got to understand that that, that, that we're not, I don't think, uh, saying that it's Australia's job to open its gates or doors to all of them, but surely it's Australia's job to try and do more in the world to show that the UNHCR and, and what it's doing is valid and worthwhile and we actually take it seriously. I also think it's it's a really dangerous sort of false dichotomy to get into around people who arrive by boat and the genuine refugee somewhere off in, in that very nice and, and safe orderly queue that exists. Um, uh, Australia does do resettlement pretty well. Um, we're about third, seventh, depending on, on, on how you slice and dice the numbers, and the resettlement services for people who do come through the humanitarian program um, are pretty good by, by international standards. Um, the number has been cut. It's 13,750 at the moment. It was at 20,000 in, two, in 2012. It's supposed to be inching back up. Does Australia have capacity to take significantly more than even that 20,000 figure? Absolutely. But I don't think by being generous on one side or, 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 or running an orderly refugee resettlement program means that you necessarily then have to be cruel to other people who arrive in a different manner. It doesn't have to be one or the other. And I, I, I think that false dichotomy is a really dangerous argument to get into. I wanted to thank very much our speakers for tonight, uh, for coming along. And I'd also like to thank them for all their ongoing work on researching, reporting and commentating on this issue and continuing to expose the cruelty and damage that is being inflicted on already vulnerable uh, people. And your work is critical, so thank you and please continue. Uh, look, um, there are two brief motions that we um, are asking the, the meeting to consider. Thank you. Uh, the first motion is in relation to the recent High Court decision and um, uh, I won't go into a lot of background. Uh, it's been mentioned that um, uh, uh, the recent decision um, ruled that there was no legal impediment or constitutional impediment to sending uh, people in Australia back to offshore immigration detention in Nauru. The effect of the judgment, um, uh, um, uh, which incidentally um, was uh, passed due to retrospective legislation that the government put in place after the court uh, case had already been started and shamefully um, supported by the ALP. Um, what this means is that 267 asylum seekers are now at risk of being um, uh, forced back to detention in Nauru and Manus Island. And of these 267 people, 91 are children, 37 babies born in Australia. Uh, and look, the, it's now well documented the harm and damage that indefinite mandatory detention uh, is doing to people. In fact, uh, the Border Force's own medical, chief medical officer has acknowledged that in the last couple of days um, uh, where he's saying the scientific evidence is that detention affects the mental state of children. Wherever possible, children should not be put in detention. And yet the policy continues to be prosecuted. So the motion reads, this meeting demands that the federal government not send back to detention in Manus Island or Nauru the 267 asylum seekers, including 91 children, 37 of whom are babies born in Australia, who were brought here from offshore detention. Furthermore, this meeting supports all church, union and other organisations and state and territory governments who have offered these people sanctuary. So I'll put this motion to the meeting. All those in favour? All those against? <coughs> I declare it unanimously passed, so that's great. Thank you. And the motion will be sent, and, and the outcome, the unanimous outcome, uh, uh, will be sent, advice will be sent to our local federal MPs, Andrew Lee, Katie Gallagher, 
Gay Brodman and Seth Seselja, as well as Prime Minister Turnbull, Immigration Minister Peter Dutton, Opposition Leader Bill Shorten, Green Senator Sarah Hanson Young, and State and, uh, ter uh, and Territory Premiers and Chief Ministers. So thank you. The second motion is in relation to um, uh, the death of Reza Barati, and tomorrow marks two years uh, since um, Reza Barati, a 23-year-old Iranian, Iranian asylum seeker, was murdered while in detention in the Australian-run detention centre on Manus Island in PNG. And tragically, more people have died in detention since then. And despite the evidence that up to 15 people were involved in the attack and killing of Reza Barati, only two men have been charged and the case is progressing at a snail's pace. There's no political will to prosecute in this case on the part of either the PNG or the Australian governments. A key eyewitness, Benham Sattar, who is still incarcerated on Manus Island, has reported receiving ongoing death threats and is in constant fear of his life or for his life. And despite pl repeated pleas to be moved to a different compound, these requests have been rejected. A petition to bring Benham Sattar to Australia for protection has attracted more than 15,000 signatures. The motion reads, this meeting notes that the murder of Reza Barati at the Australian-run offshore detention centre on Manus Island took place two years ago and demands that the federal government guarantee the safety of Benham Sattar, a key eyewitness in the current PNG murder trial, by immediately bringing him to Australia. I'll put this motion to the meeting. All those in favour? All those against? I'll declare that unanimously passed, so that's great. Thank you very much. And again, the motion will be sent to our local federal MPs, uh, uh, to um, uh, Minister Turnbull, to Peter Dutton, to Bill Shorten and to Sarah Hanson-Young. So look, I want to thank you all again um, uh, um, uh, for coming tonight and to thank our speakers for their contribution tonight. Um, we're very much appreciative of them agreeing to speak um, and travelling to do so. Um, uh, so please um, uh, thank Paul Bongiorno, First Dog on the Moon, Ben Doherty and Michelle Dunbar. thank all you for coming out tonight and for those of you who um, I didn't get a seat I want to thank you for your patience in, in um, persevering so um, uh, um, that's great and your ongoing involvement is critical um, if this campaign is going to be successful in bringing about a better refugee policy.